If you have your Bible, and I hope you do, open it up to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. Last year, I addressed this same room out of this verse, and I spoke on heeding the voice of our spiritual fathers, reminding us that over the last 30, 40 years, what the great men and women of the faith in our nation have been warning us as a nation to turn our hearts back to God, that as spiritual children, we would turn our hearts to our spiritual fathers and heed their voice. Well, this year I want to talk to you tonight out of the same text, but I want to talk about turning the hearts of the fathers to their children. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So, Father, we thank you for your word. Send the spirit and power of Elijah. Send the anointing of the Holy Spirit to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Release a great season of mercy, a great season of restoration, and glorify the name of your Son and bring great glory in the church and in the home by Christ Jesus. Amen. Tonight I want to look at this passage because this is more than just a cute passage about children's church. This is an end-time prophecy about God the Father's end-time plan of restoration. The very last verse in the Old Testament gives us a prophetic promise that before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the Lord would send the prophet Elijah, an administration of the Holy Spirit, that would serve to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Now, when Jesus went up on the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter, James, and John went with him and he revealed himself and as he prayed, his face changed and he shone like the sun in all of its strength and all of his glory, he appeared to those three disciples and he revealed his messianic identity and his glory and power. And on the way back down the mountain, they referred to this scripture. They said, Jesus, we know now that you're the Messiah. Peter's gave the great confession. You've identified yourself, and now you've shown us your glory. We know you're the Messiah, but the word of God tells us that before the Messiah would come, that great and terrible day of the Lord, when all the nations would be subdued under the Messianic reign, that Elijah would come. Where's Elijah? If you're the Messiah, where's Elijah? Malachi 4, verse 5 and 6 tells us that Elijah has to precede the coming of the Lord. Jesus said, Elijah is coming. And Elijah will restore all things. And then he says, and indeed, Elijah has come. In John the Baptist, in the first question, you say, Jesus, uh, uh, we know the rules of grammar. Elijah can't come in the future and can't have already come. 
How is Elijah coming and will restore all things? And how has Elijah already come? And Jesus is referring to this application that before his first coming, that the spirit and power, like the angel Gabriel said, the spirit and power of Elijah would rest upon John to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the disobedient to the just. But just like the spirit of Elijah came on John before the second coming of the Lord, that same operation of the Holy Spirit, that same prophetic anointing of the Holy Spirit would rest upon the church and turn the hearts of fathers to their children and children to their fathers. Now, as we look at this prophecy, it's outstanding. It reveals that the key part of God's strategy lies in an area that I would not have imagined when I would read this prophecy. Looking at this text, I would have thought that this powerful end time strategy of God the Father might have read something like this. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he will restore government and he will raise up kings and he will tear them down and righteous laws shall fill the land. I would have thought God's end time strategy would focus on government. Or perhaps what about the sphere of religion? I would have, might have imagined the prophecy saying something like this. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord and he will cleanse the priesthood. He will come like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap and he will restore righteousness among his servants. I mean, that sounds powerful. Government, religion, or what about education? What about that sphere? Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet, and no longer shall they say, you shall know the Lord, but everyone shall know the Lord, for the knowledge of God will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. That's a great prophecy. And yet, God doesn't highlight the restoration of government. He doesn't highlight the restoration of religious fears. He doesn't highlight the restoration of education. He focuses in on this more fundamental building block that God has established from the very beginning in the garden called the family. Beloved, this is an amazing promise that before the coming of the Lord, God will release an anointing upon his people to turn us to one another in love. I don't know about you, but this prophecy gives me a lot of hope today, especially in light of many end time scriptures like 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 5. It warns that in the end times, perilous times will come. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, and right next to blasphemers, disobedient to parents unthankful, unholy, unforgiving. Jesus warns us in the last days that the love of many will grow cold and fathers will betray children. Children will betray fathers. There'll be this betrayal in the midst of households and families. Daniel 10 verse 1 speaks of incredible warfare that will come in that day. And even 1 Timothy 4 verse 3 tells us that there will be a day when even society will outlaw marriage. That no longer will it be about what sex can marry what sex. It will be that marriage itself is an outdated concept. But running simultaneously with these disheartening words about disobedient children, lovelessness, pride, rebellion, betrayal, the illegalization of marriage, 
right in the middle of that is Malachi's promise like a beacon of hope that God in the darkest hour, in the most troubling hour, he has provision for our families. He will release an operation of the Holy Spirit that will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, the hearts of children to their fathers. Now, tonight I want to talk about that. Fathers turning their hearts to children, and some of you in the, in the crowd might be saying, oh, why is it always about fathers? What about the moms? I do all the work. Can't you have a prophecy about me in there? I mean, he doesn't even take out the trash and he gets a prophecy. <laughs> well, 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 you see, it's, it's simple. You don't have to turn a mother's heart to her children. I realized that the very first, the very first moments of childbirth. I mean, it was a rough night. Rachel, it was her first child. She was in labor like 24 hours. It was traumatizing to me. It was, it was tough. I mean, I tried to help her and do that whole Lamaze focus thing. She told me to get away from her and don't touch her. Take those tennis balls somewhere else. I mean, it was rough. I had to watch that machine with the, that, that what is it that shows, what is that thing? The con what, what is it? Contractions. I mean, it was hard to look at that machine and those big contractions. I went down to get a donut. I'd been up all night. I mean, at 6 a.m., I mean, my goodness. And those chairs, have you ever tried to sleep in a hospital chair, people? It's rough. So I went to go get a donut, and suddenly I heard, Alan Hood, please come to labor and delivery right now. Alan Hood, please come to labor and delivery right now. I didn't even get the donut. I ran straight up the stairs, and as I came in the room, they were tearing the bed apart, and I heard Rachel scream, Never leave me again! Rachel was so small that she didn't fit in the stirrup, so I had to hold her in. So I've got one foot. She's got one foot in a stirrup, and I'm holding the other foot. And I've got a front row seat as a brand new husband. That ain't going to work. Help! And I remember as my son came out, and they asked me, they said, do you want to hold him? I go, uh-uh. Something's wrong with his head. That ain't my baby. That's an alien's child. His head's like, fix his head. I'll think about it. I mean, it had stuff all over. I, I was like, but my wife, I mean, I, my wife immediately, she's like, give him to me. <laughs> See, you don't have to turn a mother's heart. You know, in the animal kingdom, fathers will eat their, their children. I'm not sure what that has to do with our message, but it is an interesting fact. You see, a, a mother's heart doesn't have to be turned, but God promises that a father's heart will become tender towards his children. You might be asking, why does God even highlight Elijah's ministry when addressing the issue of fatherhood? If you were to look at the Old Testament, there's other prophets that I might have chosen, like Isaiah, when he says in Isaiah 8, here I stand with my prophetess wife and my prophetic children. He's the picture of fatherhood. Why not Isaiah? And I want to give you three quick reasons. The first one is this, that in the days of Elijah's ministry, King Ahab was not walking in the faith of his fathers. The second reason is, is right before Elijah is introduced to us, there's this short little story. It's actually a tragic story. 
It says, in the days of Hiel of Bethel, this man by the name of Hiel, who's from a town that was a revival center where the gateway of heaven came to, to Jacob. He comes and he decides to do something that no one else has dared to do. He wants to rebuild Jericho. There's only one problem with rebuilding Jericho. Joshua put a curse on it. He said, whoever rebuilds this city will lay the foundation with their oldest son. And whoever builds this city, when they finish the gates, they'll bury their youngest son. And you might have given Hael the benefit of the doubt. Oh, that's just an old wives tale. But when he lays the foundation, his oldest son is struck dead. And now he knows the curse is true. And you know what he does? He considers the profit he will make as the founder of that city more valuable. He looks at his youngest son and he still continues to build the city. And when the gate of the city of Jericho is finished and the walls, his youngest son is struck dead and he buries them both. In other words, he's where Elijah comes forth in the day when fathers are willing to exchange their children for profit and success. And in that context, Elijah comes forth to speak God's word and to challenge the spirit of the age. The third reason is, it's because we usually think of Elijah and his Mount Carmel calling down fire from heaven on the priest of Baal, but we rarely discuss how God prepared him for that supernatural encounter. He prepares Elijah for the calling down of fire by taking care of a widow and her son. In fact, he will not only take care of that widow, that single mother and her child, he will raise that son from the dead before the story's over. Elijah is that picture of the father that raises children from the dead and takes care of the poor and the widow. And only after he's done that is he qualified to call fire down from heaven. Beloved, this is a wonderful hour when God is revealing his fatherhood to the nations. Oh, beloved, even as we sing tonight, how many of you love that? I am a child of God. Didn't you want to keep singing it? The Father is revealing his heart to the nations in three primary ways. Number one, He's revealing it through the person of his son, Jesus. Oh, beloved, do you know one of the titles of Jesus in Isaiah uh, 9, verses 6 and 7? It says that he is wonderful counselor. Do you remember that great, that great verse? Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, and everlasting father. Do you know Jesus didn't act like a father? He is a father at the core of his heart, at the core of his being. He's a father. As a matter of fact, the gospel tells us whenever you see Jesus, you see the father. Whenever you hear him, you hear the father. Whenever he speaks, it's the father speaking. Philip said, Jesus, show us the Father and we'll believe you. Jesus said, Philip, have I been with you these three and a half years and you asked me to show you the Father? I and the Father are one. Oh, beloved, the revelation of Jesus Christ is touching our hearts these days. When you see him, you see the Father. Oh, beloved, will you read those words in red and fall in love with Jesus and know that when you fall in love with him, He's just like his dad. He's just like the heavenly father. Oh, you know how good news this is tonight? You don't have to guess what God is like. You don't have to wonder what your heavenly father's like. Why? He's fleshed it out. Whew. He's shown you. You don't have to wonder if God loves you. Love you. 
He became you and then died your death. No greater love hath a man than to lay down his life for his friends. Beloved, he didn't lay down his life for his friends. He laid down his life for his enemies, for those who rejected him. How, what do you do with a God that when you're crucifying him, he forgives you? What do you do with that kind of God? Jesus reveals the Father. In the most glorious hour, he loved us to the end. The second way the Father is revealing his heart is by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5 tells us that God the Father pours out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. How many of you are glad tonight that experiencing the Father's love isn't dependent on your experience of your earthly father? That's good news tonight. And it's especially good news in light of what the scripture says. He's a father to the fatherless. He sets the lonely in families. If you didn't know your father, guess what? You have a father. He's a father to the fatherless. He's put his eyes on you. He's watching over you. He's reaching out to you. He's calling you. And he waits and looks for his prodigal sons and daughters from afar off. And when he sees them, he rolls up his pants and he runs to them. And he puts a ring on their finger and a robe on their back and slippers on their feet. And he kills the fatted calf. Oh, beloved, he wants to, you to experience that love by the Holy Spirit. And then third, and this is where I'm going to begin my charge to fathers. He wants to reveal it, his father's heart, through men in the church. God's going to restore a father's heart to men in the church. Uh, beloved, uh, he's going he's to do more than make us good fathers in our quiet time. I don't know about you, but I'm an amazing dad in my quiet time. You know, I didn't, we didn't sign, hey, Ladies, we didn't sign up to be bad dads and terrible husbands. I mean, it comes natural, but we, we don't, it's not that we like it. In my quiet time, I'm amazing. I love my wife. I'm grateful for her. I think about my children. I pray for their needs. I mean, I'm amazing in my quiet time. It's when I come out, that's the problem. But you know what? God has provision. He's going to make us good fathers even beyond our quiet times that we might flesh it out. Beloved, I want to say this clearly. What men believe about their individual responsibility as fathers to their natural and spiritual children is one of the most significant issues to settle in seeking to expand the kingdom of God. Families without committed fathers, churches that permit their men to neglect their children and wives and ministries lacking a father's heart and wisdom will be greatly ineffective in restoring the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Beloved, the good news tonight is Malachi's promise. God has a strategy. He has a provision to restore the home. Beloved, God will restore natural fathers to their natural children, even in a generation filled with divorce. God will reconcile hurting relationships. Do you know even before Christ's return, the Lord will establish men as fathers to even children who aren't their natural children. Beloved, as we're watching, even now, the adoption move across the body of Christ is wondrous. That men are being moved to adopt other people's children. This is a supernatural move. When they asked George Whitfield, the thunderous preacher, they asked him, what is the greatest thing you've ever done? Do you know how he answered that picture? George Whitfield would stand in front of a crowd 
two and a half times this size without a microphone and boom of the Lord's glorious love in Christ. He witnessed to hundreds of thousands, saw a mighty move of God throughout New England. And they asked him, George, what is the greatest thing you've ever done? You know what his answer was? The orphanage he built in Georgia. One of America's greatest evangelists said his greatest work was the orphanage in the state of Georgia that he built and financed and supported. God is doing a supernatural work. He's even touching like my heart. I, you know, I, I think I love other people's kids. I want to. And God's inviting us to, to step outside of our nuclear families and love other people's kids. I, I thought I loved other people's kids until their kids hit my kids. I, I remember when my son, my oldest son called me and he goes, Dad, I've got a problem. And you see, there's this bully on our soccer team. And he's been bullying me and bullying other kids. And mom has given me certain counsel, but I'd like to hear your counsel. I said, well, what counsel did your mom give? Well, she, she thought we need to do acts of kindness. To I, I go, hold on, son. <laughs> hold on. I appreciate your mother. She's got a good heart. But this is a man thing. <laughs> you see, women don't understand the issue of justice in our role to protect the weak. So here's what you're going to do. See, the next time he pushes you or somebody else, you're going to warn him. Then if he does it again, you're going to take your right hand. And you're going to hit him right there in the nose as hard as you can. Right there in the nose. Hard as you can. He goes, Dad, Dad, what if, what if he beats me up? Oh, well, he's going to beat you up. I mean, that's a given. He's going to beat you up. But then after he beats you up, the next time he goes to push you, you hit him right there in the nose again. And he's going to beat you up about three times. But the fourth time, you hit him in that nose in the same spot. He's going to realize that bullying isn't worth it. He goes, uh, he just had, had this all confused look on his face like. I said, trust me, son. Your mother had good intentions. <laughs> About two hours later, Rachel called me. <laughs> she, she called me. She said, uh, honey, uh, uh, Samuel told me what you told him to do. And, you know, I, I don't. You're right, I don't understand this whole machismo, macho, man, justice, take up for the weak, you know, thing. I know I supposedly don't get it, and it's a man thing, and you're trying to teach your son how to protect the weak. But are you sure God gave you that counsel? I said, don't bring God into this. <laughs> she goes because here's why you see that little boy on his soccer team that's bullying everyone his parents died he's been in and out of foster homes and now he's living with his grandparents and all he's ever known is somebody hitting him in the nose I thought we would buy him a soccer ball and invite him over and love on him. And through kindness, lead him to the love of Christ. Are you sure God told you this? Oh. 
You see, I thought I loved other people's kids till they hit my kid. And the Holy Spirit whispered my heart and said, Alan, you need a supernatural love. Why do we need a supernatural love? Because out of the 75 million young people in America that are under the age of 18, by the way, which is the fifth largest harvest field in the world. Did you know we have the fifth largest population of young people in the entire world? China, India, Pakistan, Mexico, America. Out of 75 million young people, 25 million do not live with their biological fathers. One third of our young people do not live with their biological father. Beloved, what is that going to look like in our nation when one third of our men have not been fathered but have spent a decade watching pornography and other filth that dehumanizes women? Oh, I tell you, it's not a good time to be a young girl in America. God's going to have to do a supernatural move in our hearts to love young men who are not our own, to father them, to love them. Oh, I tell you, God is going to restore fatherhood in this hour. God is going to restore spiritual fathers in the church. The leaders of our generation will be fully established as men filled with the heart and wisdom of a father. Paul said, for though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. God is going to begin to put his father's heart in us. Not just so we can fill it at the altar, but we can lead the next generation to Christ. To father a fatherless generation. Oh, I tell you, Being graced by God with a father's wisdom and gentleness is one of the greatest privileges of men in this generation. That God is going to take hard-hearted men, even like me, and make us gentle. I tell you what, I, I, God set me up. I came from a family where we showed our love by putting each other down. You knew we loved each other by how loud or how we picked on each other or aggravated each other or, or, or messed with each other. That was our love language. Did anybody have that language called aggravation, sarcasm? Where your siblings would mess with you, but if somebody else touches you, watch out. But then I married this girl. She... She was the surprise. She had four siblings. Linda, her closest sister, was eight years older. Her oldest brother was 16. She just showed up, and she was the love child. Nurture. Their family nurtures. They're like, cherish you, nurture, love, have coffee, talk about your feelings. <laughs> they don't even know what aggravation is. And God put us together. I'm like, ah! And she's like, ah! And I told our boys, sons, I don't know what to do. I am not naturally a cherisher or nurturer. You know, you nurture my sons by, stop crying. <laughs> I still love you, you know. Stop crying. I, it just doesn't come natural, nurture. But you know what? God put me with this gal and tricked me. You know, that's the secret. You think you're marrying for love and you're marrying for holiness. It's the great sanctifier. You see, when I was single, I thought I was so holy. I wasn't holy. I just avoided you. If you got on my nerves, I just left. 
Went back and did my Bible study. That's not sanctification. That's avoidance. But you get married and they never leave you. You go to bed with them. You wake up with them. They're at breakfast. They're at supper. Ah! <laughs> and the Lord wants to make two flesh one. You know the only way for two flesh to become one? Death. <laughs> the great gift of God, marriage. But the evil one, I tell my, before I go on, my, I tell my sons this all the time. I go, you watch. Your father's not a naturally gentle, kind man. But before this thing's over, you're going to watch the power of God over decades make me tender, make me holy, make me loving. You're going to see that my love might be weak, but it's real. And I'm going to cooperate with God's sanctifying process. The Lord is going to give us this great privilege of being tender fathers in this generation. Beloved, but we have to face the fact the evil one has assaulted our families. And why? Why does the enemy rage? He's not even, you know what? He'll even let you have a big ministry so that he can then destroy your family. He's not as scared of your ministry as he is of your love for your wife and your children. He'll let the cult of personality go on the stage, but he'll come after your marriage. He'll strike at your children. He'll try to divide your home. You know the evil one is an expert at turning fathers against children, children against fathers, husbands against wives, wives against husbands. He's been doing it for centuries, millennia. Here's the good news. God has an answer. It's called the spirit and power of Elijah resting on the Christian home. God has provision, his Holy Spirit resting upon entire families. Beloved, you know what the Bible says? Blessed is the man who has many sons. He will contend with the enemy in his gate. Do you know the power that God releases to a family when they are in unity in the grace of God in Christ Jesus? No weapon formed against them can prosper. I tell you what, we don't understand. There's a lot of talk about dominion today. But beloved, do you know the dominion mandate to subdue the earth was given to a family, to a husband and a wife? to subdue the earth and multiply. And the evil one knows that when husbands and wives pray together and come together in the grace of God and they refuse to give up and they contend for covenant, powers released, light, explosion of grace. In these last few minutes, I want to offer five things. Five practical ways for us as fathers to turn our hearts to our children. Now, wives, write these down and pray for them for your husband. Don't measure him and critique him. Just pray for him. Young men, write these down. This is good preparation. Because God's going to turn the tide and he's going to raise up a faithful group of men who resist the temptations and stay true to their families. The first thing we must do to turn our hearts to our children is this. Let me ask a question first. Young men, is there anybody here that just wants to get married and fail? Is there anyone here that wants to have children that live disconnected from them? 
I tell you what, when my sons were born, I felt a love like I've never known, and I suddenly realized something. I don't love my parents the way they love me. I thought I loved my parents, but when I, when I saw my sons that looked like me, that talked like me, something in my heart was moved. I loved them, and the thought of them not being friends with me, not loving with me, not knowing my Savior, not living forever. It's the worst thought imaginable. I'd give my life before that. I'd rather you take me out. I'd rather give my life than to experience that horror. So as I say these fives, these aren't small things. Don't go, well, he's talking to the adults. No, actually, I'm talking to a whole group of young people who are going to do it right. Who are going to step into the grace of God from the beginning and do it right. Not perfect, but they're going to do it right. First thing, we must ask the Heavenly Father to reveal his loving heart to us. We need to move among men. I, thir- I truly believe that revival coming to the church in these last days is going to start with men in community that have experienced the love of the Heavenly Father. No matter what your father and his weaknesses were towards you, no matter what the trauma you experienced, the good news is tonight that you can experience the love of the Father by the Holy Spirit. That you can forgive your Father and you can move in the grace of God to start a new heritage. Beloved, the Father said the most amazing thing to Jesus before he ever did one miracle, before he ever gave one lesson, Before he ever gave the Sermon on the Mount, the Father spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. You might say to yourself, Well, of course he's well pleased with Jesus. He's sinless. He's perfect. He's one with the Father. He's the very Son of God, the Son of the Most High. But do you know what Jesus prayed? He prayed the most outstanding prayer In John 17, 23, he prayed that the world may know that you, the Father, have loved them as you've loved me. Now, I want you to hear that. Jesus never lies. He never exaggerates. And he prays this. The Father wants you to know that he loves you the same way he loves me. What do you mean, Jesus? Let me ask you a question. Can God the Father love Jesus any more than he loves him right now? No. He loves him fully, wholeheartedly. And Jesus is telling us the same way the Father loves him, he loves us. Beloved, we need a revelation of this. We don't need to just come to church. We need an encounter with the love of the Father We need to leave our pain at the altar and receive his healing love and forgive our earthly fathers for their shortcoming that we might not reproduce it with our own sons and daughters. The second thing, as fathers, we must ask the Lord to turn our hearts towards our children. Beloved, there's a required turning. He wants to turn our hearts We must go into an intentional season of prayer and reflection, asking God the Father to turn our hearts. Turn my heart. You might think you've loved as much as you can love. Beloved, we haven't even scratched the surface of the love of the Father. Father, turn my heart to my children. Do you know there are many generations that are willing to sell out their legacy for their own short-term gratification. David looks at the equivalent of pornography 
he looks over the wall of his roof of his house and he looks at Bathsheba taking a bath. And that visual moves him to commit adultery and to kill Uriah, her husband. Do you know what the prophet said, David? Because you, because you did this very thing, a sword will be loosed in your house all your days. Do you know what a sword looked like? An infant son of his died. His daughter was raped by one of his sons. That son was killed by another son. Then that son was killed by his cousin. Then his other son, Adonijah, was killed by another son. Do you know he lost four sons, one at, one at birth, and then three that were killed by other family members? What a tragedy for a little bit of peeping, a little bit of voyeurism, a little bit of porn, and, a, and an adultery. He looses the sword in his house. David was at worth four sons and one daughter raped and left without marriage for the rest of her life. Beloved, We've got to stop the madness. It's not worth it. We can't sell out our heritage for a little gratification. Hezekiah, he made an alliance with a foreign nation. And Isaiah the prophet said to him, because you've made this alliance, your sons will be taken to a foreign land and they will be made eunuchs. And do you know what Hezekiah said? Will it happen in my generation? No. Well, if this seems good then to the Lord, so be it. What do you mean, Hezekiah? Did you hear the prophet? Your sons. Your sons, Hezekiah. Your sons are going to be taken captive and made eunuchs. Your heritage is going to be wiped out. They're going to be eunuchs. And it's good. How about tears, Hezekiah? How about falling on your face, pleading with God that he'd have mercy? How about undoing the alliance? Beloved, there are too many men of God selling their heritage Loosing the sword in their midst. We've got to turn our hearts to our children. We've got to be unwilling to give up our heritage, our namesake, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. Beloved, we must turn our hearts to our children by asking their forgiveness for our shortcomings. And number two, let me tell you, one of the biggest gifts we can give them as fathers is the gift of humility. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I tell my children this all the time. I say, sons, you're going to have many things you have to forgive me for. I, I'm, a, I'm authentic, but I'm imperfect, and I'm frail, and I'm weak, and you're going to have many things to forgive me for. But know this. Whatever you don't forgive me for, you get to keep. Whatever you don't forgive me for will be reproduced in your life. And the Lord leads me to ask forgiveness quickly. I'm sorry. It's a great gift to give to our kids so they can forgive us and not be bound by that which has bound us. And then we must get in the battle with our children. Oh, I tell you, beloved, we've got to face the Goliath of our day. We've got to talk about it without shame. Pornography is killing the Christian home. It's destroying our marriages. 
It's destroying our thinking, our emotions, our sexuality. It's destroying our daughters and our sons. We've got to get in the battle with our children and not heap shame on them. We know they're going to get exposed at some point. Let's get in the battle. Let's teach them to fight. I remember I took my sons off. I'm not waiting for their Christian private school to teach them sexuality. I'm their dad. I took them off on a, on a weekend. And we went through sexuality. And the first session I taught on the God of pleasure who designed sexuality for pleasure as well as procreation. The God of pleasure. The second session, I talked about safe boundaries for that pleasure. The right boundaries, the right context for it to flourish. The third session, I talked about temptation and how to overcome it. And in the fourth session, we talked about what are they looking for in a wife. I'll never forget it. I asked my son, my oldest son, he had like, I mean, a whole list of virtues. and (laughs) It's like the perfect woman. And then I asked my second son, he was like, I want a girl about this tall, green eyes, and... uh, I was like, well, I wasn't really thinking about shapes and eyes colors, but that's okay. And then I got to my youngest son, and I said, "What, Joshua, he was 14. I go, Joshua, what are you looking for in your wife? He goes, Dad. He goes, I don't know. He goes, I'm just glad to be in the room. This has been awesome. (laughs) And then at the end of it, we made a purity pack between ourselves that we were going to keep our eyes pure me for my spouse and them for their future spouses we bought calendars and checked off days that we kept our eyes pure and if for some reason we caught our eyes glancing and looking we would find each other and pray for one another oh, I want to tell you dads we've got to get in the fight and we can't be afraid why because Our generation was the first to receive that onslaught of pornography. Like heroin and crack cocaine, it's coming to the church and it's overwhelmed the generation. And it went from magazines to at a click of a button, you can have any way, shape, or form in a moment. And we've got to talk about it and get in the fight. I'm here to plead with you dads. We've got to hold the line. If you're struggling with it tonight and there's a chance that there's a good percentage of men my age and fathers in the room who are caught in addiction, we've got to fight this Goliath. We cannot play games in the darkness. It will destroy our children if we don't take our stand. We've got to take our stand and battle it to the end, and we've got to get in the battle with our children and teach them how to overcome it. Oh, I'm telling you, there was a time in Africa when Islam spread down through, and as Islam began to spread, the first wave of pastors, that first generation, didn't know how to quite deal with it, but they held their line till their children were born. And their children were raised to know how to witness to Muslims. And then the third generation came forward, mighty in God, to take the gospel into villages, into nations. Beloved, do you know what? We've got a greater threat than Islam today. It's in our homes. It's called the Goliath of pornography. And every father in this room has got to take his ground. Hold the line. Talk to his sons and daughters and get in the battle. We've got to overcome this one, beloved. We've got to do our due diligence. Let me ask you a question. My sons, if they're struggling, I don't care if their school needs the internet to do their work, I'll homeschool them. I don't care. If they don't have social media for a year, 
I'm not letting a destroyer in my house. Can you imagine if you let a mountain lion run around in your house free? And somebody said to you, why are you letting him in your house? Well, he's got to catch the mice. He's there to catch the mice. We need him to catch the mice. I'll have parents who come to me and say, my kid's been addicted for eight years. I go, is there internet in your house? Yes. Well, they need it for school. What do you mean? We've got to be tenacious. We've got to get wise. We're giving, we're giving little adult shops on smartphones to our sons at the age of eight with no restrictions, and we wonder why they're addicted for seven years. We've got to fight this thing. We've got to turn the tide. We've got to equip our sons to win the battle. Beloved, I'm not saying this. I'm not speaking down. I'm saying we've got to turn this tide. Why? Because God has provision in the Holy Spirit to overcome this thing and to win. And if we do our job, our children will grow up and know how to fight this thing. And our grandsons will grow up and know how to deal with this thing. And you'll see a whole generation able to lead lost out of the darkness into his glorious light. We've got to do whatever it takes. We moved into a new house and we decided to turn off the internet for six months. Oh my gosh, the detox of that the first month. Oh my goodness. But you know what? Six months later, I think it might just stay that way. It's amazing, the restoration of love. Here's two more things, and I know I'm going a long time. Two things that are very important. As fathers, we must build a family altar in our homes and record our family's prophetic storyline. Beloved, the day of the prophetic wife and the dull husband is over. It's over. It's gone. You won't make it in the urgent hour we're going into. This is an hour made for men if we'll get in the game. I go to prayer rooms all over the nation and the nations, and it's mostly filled with women. I love women in our prayer rooms. Oh, thank God for praying women. But beloved, there's something when men come together in community and resist the spirit of the age and the spirit of lust, and they get a prophetic spirit on their life. Let me tell you, nothing replaces a man walking through his house and praying. Nothing replaces a man singing through the halls of his home and in the bedrooms of his daughters and sons. Do you know what Abraham did? The very first thing he did is he walked the land and built altars. And when you read the book of Genesis, those altars of worship he built his children and grandchildren had prophetic encounters on. Beloved, I want to sing in my house. I want to worship in my house. I want to prophesy in my house. I want my spirit to be alive in my home. Why? So my sons can have dreams in the night. So my sons and my daughters can have encounters in the night. Oh, I tell you, you want your children to get saved? You start singing. Turn off ESPN. Turn it off. The news ain't that good anyway. I mean, if you turn on CNN or Fox, it's only going to show Donald Trump making fun of someone anyway. How many people can he call loser and we'd be entertained by it? Turn it off. Start singing. Start praying in the spirit in your home. Start singing in the spirit in your home. Start praying prophesying, even do what old women do. Take out a bottle of oil. Just start doing something. Something. 
I walk into a house and the wife gives me a prophetic word and the guy's over on the couch like Jabba the Hut. We got to break that off. We're men. We were made for war. It's time to get in the battle. We need a group of men who say, not my children on my watch. And they gear up themselves for war and action. Oh, I tell you, there's nothing more glorious than an army marching over a hill of men in their battle attire. And we've got to pull on the whole armor of God. It's time to shake off the dust. Put on your beautiful garments. And quit letting devils run your household. Kick them out and get vigilant about it. Get a little meanness in your eye. Get some fire on your spirit. Oh, the day, the glorious day when the men of God have fire on their spirit. When like David's mighty men, you can say, I fought a battle. Oh, when you read about the mighty men of David, I look at that and go, we're not killing people today, but we can take some devils out. We can win some neighborhoods. Turn off the television, start prayer walking your neighborhood with three other guys and watch the fire get on your spirit. Start meeting and prophesying and praying. Start declaring over your children what they were made for and what you know to be true. We can't sit on the couch watching TV and then condemn our children any longer. Placing shame on them with a religious spirit while our own spirits are dull and dying. We got to get fire and fire's contagious. Oh, I'm ready for some men to go to war with. I tell you what, the spirit and power of Elijah's coming. Question is, do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it resting on your home, your marriage, your spirit? Oh, I tell you, it's time for a prophetic church to arise. And then the last thing I want to say We've got to turn our hearts to our children with this, an unwavering commitment to our wives. Young men, just get it in your spirit right now. When you go to get married, you look at her and say, I am never, ever leaving you. Beloved, I want to say this. I have, I, I'm a pastor. I have middle-aged men come to me all the time. I just don't feel it anymore. You don't know what I've been through. I'm so disillusioned. I go, I, I, I appreciate you. I love you. I'm sure you're disillusioned. But I need to let you know something. Your wife was disillusioned on day two of the honeymoon. <laughs> she was disillusioned faster than you were. I guarantee it. The whole thing she looked forward to her whole life, she went through the ceremony and then went, oh my gosh. You can deal with five years of disillusionment. You can press into God and find a love that's bigger than your emotions. A love that's bigger than your fleeting emotions. Let me tell you something. I've got a vision in my life. I've got a glorious vision. You know what it is? It's not to die as a Bible school president or associate director of an international movement. That means nothing. You want to know what I live for? It's this. To grow old with my wife. I want to be 85 years old, 90 years old in a rocking chair with my three sons, their three wives, and my 50 grandchildren running all around us. I don't care how they get them. They just need to get them. I want a lot of them running around, and I've got a vision. Here's what it is. My grandson's running around, all around me. There's Grandpa. He's crazy. <laughs> He's lost his mind. <laughs> he, 
and he's goofy. <laughs> but he loves Jesus. He tells the best stories. And then I can't wait as my little granddaughters run around. They look at their grandma. They go, oh, you see, grandma, she's beautiful. Do you know what? He always hears her prayers. Whatever she asks for, he gives it to her. I want to be just like her. You know what? I can live through five years of disillusionment, ten years of disappointment, four years of struggle here, three years of struggle there for that. Why? You know what it says? Greater than wealth and riches is a good name. I want to leave children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren like a beautiful army in love with Jesus marching forth in his glorious light. <laughs> Young people, you need a vision. My father-in-law and mother-in-law struggled. He, 40 years in the ministry... And they went through various struggles. And at certain times, my wife would tell me they didn't know if they were going to make it. Then they got in their, what, 70s? Was it 70s? 60s, mid-60s, something like that. And they struggled through the pain of two flesh becoming one, but they hung in there. They loved Jesus. They were sincere, but they hung in there. They didn't give up. And at the age of in their mid-60s, they looked across the room and found, fell madly in love. It was a little disgusting. I mean, they needed a room. It, it was a little too much to take. They were like high school sweethearts in their 60s. But do you know what that released in our family? As we watched two real people struggle but hold the line for God's grace and find provision. And then God broke in and they found a love greater than infatuation and greater than sexual attraction. It's called respect. They looked over at each other and said, that man cooperated with God when he didn't have to. He looked over and said, that woman cooperated with God's sanctifying process when she didn't have to and she should have left and fell madly in love in the midst of respect. You know what it led to? All the children knowing Jesus. All their spouses knowing Jesus. Every grandchild knows Jesus and walks with him. And I think two great-grandchildren have been baptized now. Beloved, do you want that heritage? Because we've sold out for less. But we need a generation to turn the tide. Here's what I want to do tonight. I've gone long. Thank you for bearing with it. But I believe God wants to do family business tonight. Family business. I want us to pray for every father in the room that goes, you know what? I want the grace of God resting on my life in greater measure. I want the spirit and power of Elijah, the operation of the Holy Spirit that turns my heart to my children. I want us to gather around and pray for every one of those men. And then there's another group I want to pray for. Every single young man in here that wants to be a father and wants to walk out fatherhood in a godly, tender way and to hold the line against the onslaught of lust and the onslaught of divorce and to have a good heritage. In fact, every young man who wants to do that, stand to your feet right now. I'm not going to give way to the spirit of the age. I'm going to keep my eyes pure. I'm going to remain faithful to my wife. I'm going to raise my kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Look at that. Hallelujah. Now I want every father. You can have a seat. Thank you. Every father today. You need the grace of God. And you're saying before the Lord, I want the spirit and power of Elijah. I want you to stand up. Every father. You go, I need the spirit and power of Elijah on my life. Now, as the team comes up to play, I want us, as you're standing there, I want people around you right now. 
just turn around them right now. And then in a minute, I'm going to invite the young people to come forward to this altar and to the altar in the middle back there. There's a whole nother altar with a whole nother ministry team. But right now, I want us to pray for fathers. That God the Father, what we sung, we are children of God. That that love of the Father would touch our hearts. That the grace of God would break in. If you're a wife here, lay hands on your husband. If you're a child here, find your dad. Put your hands on him. He's not perfect, but I guarantee you, he loves you more than you can ever imagine. Even when he doesn't know how to express it. Just everyone look around you. If you, someone's standing, put a hand on them. Pray for them. Don't wait for us as we sing. You just begin to minister to him, and then we're going to invite young men who want to walk in grace to be a father, to have the love of the father in their hearts, to stay true, to resist the tide of lust and perversion. I tell you, there's nothing more powerful than men who join together and fight the good fight and come out of darkness and hiding and begin to contend for your heritage. Men, if you're standing here today, you've given yourself to darkness. It's time to find another man. Hold yourself accountable. Begin to pray. Begin to do whatever the Spirit tells you to do to get clean and to get holy so you can lead your sons and daughters so that a whole generation can grow up and know how to fight. Just begin to lift them up in prayer. Don't wait for me. Just begin to pray for them. Father, here we are. Release the spirit and power of Elijah tonight. Every marriage that's barely hanging on, we ask God release grace. Release grace from heaven for the weakest of us. For those of us who've struggled, who've contended, God, break in. Give us a new love for our wives and children. Soften our wives' hearts to us. Do a miracle tonight, God. Cause the miracle to happen again. Bring forth love. Bring forth love. God, break in on our behalf. You said that our very marriages are a reflection of your love for us, Jesus. It's the picture of our union with you. Break in and make it glorious. Break in. Some of you, God the Father has given you a vision for heritage. He's given you a vision for children and great-grandchildren. That a thousand generations would be blessed because of your stand of love. Beloved, I believe God is about to put fire on the heart of men in the church. He's about to put fire on the heart of every home, every marriage. God, release the fire of the Holy Spirit. Release power, power. Now here's what I'd like to do. Young men, the Lord's put it on your heart. Go, I want the heart of a father. I want to stand my ground for purity. I want to marry a godly woman. I want to be faithful to her all my days. I want to earn the trust of her heart. I don't want to be a tender man. I want to be a godly, fiery man with a prophetic spirit. Let's ask for God to meet us. Let me tell you, I'm looking at you guys, young men, look at me. You're going to fight this battle against pornography and win it. You're going to win it. 
because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. But listen to me, you've got to do it together. You've got to fight this thing together. You've got to be wise. You've got to be shrewd. You've got to be strong in the Lord and his power of his might. God, we're asking you to break the power of Jezebel off a generation. Now there's an altar in the middle. Young men, there's an altar in the middle you can go to as well. Now I want the fathers to come pray for these young men. Fathers who ask for that grace, come lay hands on them and pray for them. God, raise up strong men, loving men, strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might stand in the evil day. Not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. God, we ask for a cleansing, a great turning. Tell the Lord, I turn away from pornography. I renounce the spirit of lust. I renounce perversion. I want nothing to do with divorce and unfaithfulness. I want to be holy. I want to be loving. Release your power, God. Release your fire, Holy Spirit. Come, consecrate a generation. Hear me, young people. Renounce every work of Satan, every work of the devil, every work of the world, every work of the flesh. Father, we renounce every work of Satan. We renounce every work of the flesh, every spirit of the age. We renounce it. We want nothing to do with it. We ask for a revival spirit, a revival spirit, a revival spirit in the name of Jesus. 